Okay, let's do the text evidence strategy. And what we're going to do is we're going to read through the passage like normal. But uh, when we start answering the questions, we can only choose answers that we can highlight uh, evidence for in the text. And this is to train us to not choose answers that um, don't come from information within the text. There has to be some kind of uh, evidence for every answer, every correct answer. Um, I might think of this kind of like a like the lawyer strategy where we're building a case, and in order to present that case, we need to have evidence for it. Um, so we'll read through and then look for that evidence to be able to answer our questions. So let's read through first. Uh, the recent publication in the Daily Press of instances of human longevity under the heading Links with the Past prompted a comparison between the length of time represented by the duration of a tree and the lifetime of a human being. The comparison of single lives suggested the further step of contrasting the antiquity of the oldest family histories with the remoteness of the period to which it is possible to trace the ancestry of existing members of the plant kingdom. So again, we're not highlighting right now. Uh, we're just reading, but we will highlight uh, when we start doing the actual questions. My primary object in these pages is not to deal with familiar cases of longevity in trees, but to consider in the first place some of the problems connected with the origin of the present British flora, and then to describe a few examples of different types of plants whose ancestors flourished during periods of the Earth's history, long ages before the advent of the human race. In dealing with plants of former ages, we are confronted with the difficulty of forming an adequate conception of the length of time embraced by geological periods in comparison with the duration of the historic era. Some of the selections from the Greek papyri, recently edited by Dr. Milligan, refer to the commonplace events in terms, of, in terms familiar to us in modern letters. We forget the interval of 2,000 years, which has elapsed since they were written. Similarly, the close agreement between existing plants and species which lived in remote epochs um, speaks of continuity through the ages and bridges across an extent of time too great to be expressed by ordinary standards of measurement. Terms of years, when extended beyond the limits to which our minds are accustomed, cease to have any definite meaning. While there is a certain academic interest in discussions as to the age of the Earth as expressed in years, we are utterly unable to realize the significance of the chronology employed. After speaking of the futility of attempting to introduce chronological precision into periods so recent as those which come into the purview of archaeologists, Mr. Rice Holmes suggested a method better adapted to our powers. He says, ascend the hill on which stands Dover Castle and gaze upon Cape Grisnes. Let the waters beneath you disappear. Across the chalk that once spanned the channel like a bridge, men walked from the white cliff that marks the horizon to where you stand. No arithmetical chronology can spur the imagination to flights like these. On the other hand, the use in some country districts in Britain of spindles almost identical with instruments used in spinning by ancient Egyptians and similar survivals described by the author of a book entitled The Past in the Present bring within the range of our vision an early phase of the historic era. The rude implements still fashioned by the flint nappers of Brandon and Suffolk connect the present with the Paleolithic Age, measured from the standpoint of historic reckoning, survivals from prehistoric days appeal to us as persistent types which have remained unchanged in a constantly changing world. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the questions and we're not going to an choose an answer unless we can use our highlighter and uh, highlight text that gives us evidence for that. So which of the following analogies best compares the chronological view of flora to Holmes' perspective on flora? Well, Holmes' perspective on flora was here in this paragraph. So we're probably gonna to have to get some evidence from there. Um, but let's go through the answers and see if we can find evidence for that. Looking at historical timeline versus grouping history by century. Uh, well, the, the Holmes uh, method was a non, no arithmetical, a non arithmetical chronology. Um, 
and like gazing upon things. Um, so this is a, and he's suggesting a method that is better adapted. So the non chronological precision and chronological precision was up here where they talked about years. Um, so I think we're going to have to make a comparison between years and a non kind of quantitative, non arithmetical approach. So we're going to have our arithmetical, AKA chrono chronological approach, and then our gazing non arithmetical approach. So let's see if we have a better choice for that. I don't think that, uh, a is going to be our answer there. Observing a forest versus writing notes while versus observing a forest, forest versus writing notes while sitting in a novel landscape. These both kind of sound non-arithmetical, so I don't think that the, we have good evidence that that's a good comparison. Uh, measuring time based on tree rings. Okay, that sounds chron chronological. Um, and then versus letting the mind run free while in nature. Gazing. Um, spurring the imagination. I think we can hi highlight spurring the imagination for this. And that sounds like our correct answer, but let's look at D. Measuring a plant's length versus measuring a plant's width. Now we don't have any evidence for that. So I'm gonna cross D off and then C will be our correct answer here. Uh, according to the fourth paragraph, the author suggests that using time to describe flora is futile because, okay, so that was gonna be one, two, three, four. So our evidence is gonna to have to come from this fourth paragraph. Humans are unable to understand extremely long periods of time. Let's see if we have evidence for that. Similarly, the close agreement between existing plants, species, lived uh, in remote epochs speaks of continuity through the ages, which is across the extent of time too great to be expressed by ordinary standards. So too great to be expressed by ordinary standards of measurement. In terms of years, when extended beyond the limits to which our minds are accustomed, cease to have any definite meaning. So beyond our ability, what we're normally used to, they start to not have any meaning anymore. Um, we are utterly unable to realize the significance of the chronology employed. Okay, so I think we have some pretty good evidence for to build a case for A. B, only some plants have existed longer than humans. Um, didn't see any evidence for that in paragraph four. Humans often outlive certain groups of plants. Also no evidence for that. And then D, current vocabulary cannot describe current vast periods of time. This was more talking about how humans are unable to, um, that just doesn't have any meaning anymore. And we were unable to realize the significance. It didn't have, we didn't see any evidence for current vocabulary being inadequate. It was more just humans just don't have that ability. Okay, number three, the author mentions the use of spindles in Britain as an example of. Okay, so spindles. We're here. Um, plants have, that have been repurposed for modern uses, so spindles almost identical with instruments used in spinning by the ancient Egyptians and similar survivals. Uh, bring in the range, the root implements still from flint nappers. No, it doesn't look like it's anything to do with uh, plants. Growing obsoleteness of ancient tools. Um, identical with instruments used in spinning by the ancient Egyptians. So. These are tools that are currently being used and uh, were also part of, uh, or similar to ancient tools. So I think we have evidence to say that B is not correct. Uh, C, the survival of ancient tools to the modern day. That sounds pretty right on. Um, we'd have tools that were present in ancient Egypt and they're still being used now. And then constant change throughout human history. Um, I remember I, this last sentence kind of got into that. Measured from the standpoint of historic reckoning, survivals from prehistoric days appeal to us as persistent types which have remained unchanged. So this is evidence for that not being true because these are things that did not change. Even though the world is constantly changing, this is something that stayed the same. So C would be our correct answer here. And number four, according to the passage, which of the following... Uh, is the author least likely to discuss in the remainder of the book not included in this excerpt? We, over here he said uh, my primary object in these pages is not to deal with familiar cases of longevity in trees, but to consider 
in the first place, some of the problems is uh, connected with origin of the present British flora, and then describe a few examples of different types of plants whose ancestors flourished during periods of the Earth's history, long ages before the advent of the human race. So um, origin problems are things dealing with origin of, of plants, and then plants that were present before humans were around. Debates about the origin of British flora. Yeah, he would probably talk about that. Um, that would be a, an origin situation, so that would not be a correct answer because he would talk about it. B, the family history of a sacred and, and ancient oak tree. Um, not really sure he's going to talk about that, um, so that might be our right answer. C, origins of flora prior to human occupation of Britain. Yeah, he said he was going to talk about uh, trees that were around before, or plants that were around before uh, humans were there. So I think C would be talked about. And then D, plants spread by rodents in the pre-human age. Again, some, he wanted to talk about plants that were around before humans were around, so D seems correct, which uh, D seems like something he would talk about, which makes B a correct answer. So in review, uh, we read the passage like normal, but we only chose an answer once we could highlight specific evidence for it in the text. Um, and again, this is to train us to not choose answers that are not supported by the text.